Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an enlightening top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, the top 10 ways to invest 5 free minutes. If you do a web search on how to spend five minutes, the internet is full of ideas on how to turn time into money. But what we want is to turn time into eternity. We have plans to do with things with our hours, but life goes by and we need to redeem those precious minutes. It takes the same amount of time to gossip or encourage, to daydream or pray, but time's a waste so let's start investing it. Number one, rest where you are. Sometimes people get the idea if I could just be somewhere else, get a holiday, go sit at a beach somewhere, then I could rest, but I can't rest here. But God has given us the ability to rest where they are. You remember how David said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I'd fly away and be at rest. The problem is where you go, you go. And when you unpack your suitcase, there are all your problems there too. You can't escape that easily. We can, in a sense, escape for a moment when we realize that basically everything in my life is all looked after. Nothing fundamental can ever change. God is still on the throne. Christ is my Savior. The Spirit indwells me. I have eternal life. His promises are true. So sometimes in the midst of a day, just to take a couple of minutes, sit, look at nature, relax, Breathe deeply and just remember, I'm his child and he looks after me well. And I just have that sense of rest. Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. In the midst of it all, just say, well, you know what? God is good. I love the words that were quoted often by William MacDonald. I would plan my life just the way he's planning it if I knew as much as he did. To realize, no, the Lord does know what he's doing and I can just rest in his love, rest where I am. It would be a good habit to do that each day, take five minutes to do that. Yeah. Uh, number two, visit the throne room. You know, the scripture says, be still and know that I am God. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you, Isaiah 26.3. If I had a piece of elastic, I could pin it to this table. If it was long enough, I could wrap it around you. I could wrap it around the world. But as soon as I let it go, it comes right back to where it's pinned. So this verse says that if my mind is pinned on the Lord, I'll have perfect peace. So the question is not, do I have to think about things, think about work, think about family, and so on. The question is, when my mind is allowed to come to rest, where is it pinned? If I have a couple of minutes at the stoplight, or I'm having a difficult phone call, I know I'm going to have to deal with something just before the phone rings. If my mind is pinned on the Lord, in a moment I find myself in his presence, and I realize nobody's worried. Nobody has a furrowed brow. Nobody's nibbling on their fingernails. It looks like everything's in control. And then the phone rings. And it's just in that sense, in his presence, be still and know that I am God. It's realizing in the midst of the storm, hey, look who's sleeping in the boat. <laughs> Everything is going to be okay. The Lord of life and glory is not going to end up at the bottom of this lake. So if I've got him in the boat, we're going to be okay. And so visiting the throne room, being conscious of this fact, if my mind is pinned on him in the moment of relaxation, the moment of quiet, a couple of seconds at the stoplight, if my mind's on him, then he just comes in and speaks peace to my soul in the midst of all the turmoil. Number three, take an attitude checkup. I should not be a victim to my own changes of feeling. I shouldn't constantly be allowing the uncertainty of my feelings to determine the direction of my life. I have some control over that. And I love David's example. In Psalm 42, 5, 
He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. Now he's real honest here. He says, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He's not saying, I feel like praising him right now. But God has such a good track record of getting me out of sticky situations. And I look back and say, wow, he did it again. That I know I'm going to praise him for this someday. I don't feel like it right now. But there's no reason for me to be disheartened or demoralized because God is hopeful. I can hope in God, right? Or when he's at Ziklag, things look really bad. Um, he's been kicked out of the Philistine army, of all things. Saul's trying to kill him. His own men are talking about stoning him to death. If he looks back, he sees his own failure. He shouldn't have been in the Philistine army. If he looks in, he sees his own discouragement and disqualification. So we read that David encouraged himself in the Lord. It says David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. It would be great if there were lots of people going around encouraging everybody else. Sometimes you feel alone, like there's nobody to encourage me. Well, you've got a little do-it-yourself encouragement kit. Not in yourself, not in your past decisions, not in your circumstances, but in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. So take a little attitude checkup. Wait a minute. Should I really be this demoralized? I mean, God is good. He's looking after things. He knows what's going on. He'll never leave me or forsake me. So I'm going to put my hope in God. And sure enough, he gets me through it. Number four, intercede for a friend in need. Intercede for a friend in need. If we would be more sensitive to the Spirit's promptings, I think he'd use us a lot more. He's looking for a prayer partner in your town, among your friends. He's looking for someone who's sensitive to his promptings. And so that when someone comes to mind, I don't just say, oh, yeah, that's a little misfiring of my brain. No, the Spirit of God is saying, pray for that person. And if I'd start to respond more and more to that, like the King James in Romans 12, 12, continuing instant in prayer. So I'm aware of someone, I pray for them. The Lord brings someone else to their, my mind, I pray for them. It's a great way to use a few minutes to invest in eternity. Number five, meditate on a precious thought from the Word. To meditate, as far as the world is concerned, means to empty your mind. But for a Christian, it means to fill your mind. It's a kind of tidy thinking. It's like an interior designer who moves furniture around in her brain before she actually starts doing stuff, right? And so to meditate means that I have this thought and I run it by other things I know. I use my imagination, creativity of the scriptures, circumstances in my life, hey, this fits that situation. I could have used that verse for this, or maybe even witnessing, or I have a friend who needs this verse. So meditation is recombining things in my mind, like a, like a chef who says, oh, you know, I think a little of this spice would help enhance that flavor, or I'm going to serve that with this on the side. So we take ideas in the word and think, what does this tell me about God? Or, or do I have friends that need to hear this verse? Or this should apply to my situation. So meditation is squeezing the good, chewing up, masticating, and getting all the flavors out of the truth. I think if we do that and ask the Lord to, uh, to illuminate our minds to see the truth in a fresh way, and then say, Lord, Give me someone to share this with. It's a great way to get the good out of a passage. It buys back the time. My mind is like quicksilver, and it runs in all the wrong directions. And so again, if I can, uh, the scripture says, how do I keep pure? By meditating on his word, by putting it in there and keeping it fresh in my mind. 
It's a great way to spend five minutes. Number six, reach out to encourage someone. We have so many tools today, whether by text or email or calling or sending something, to say, I just prayed for you, the Lord laid you on my heart, I wanted to encourage you. We need this. We need it. God's people need each other. I saw this first in Japan many years ago where the Christians were using technology in this way. They'd uh, have a little bathroom break, they'd go into the bathroom, and they'd text one of their friends, I just had a chance to witness to someone, pray for me. Or, I'm feeling a bit discouraged, the boss gave me a hard time, help me to be more diligent, whatever it might be. And they were constantly sharing things with one another, and they felt this sense of esprit de corps, we're in this thing together. Instead of feeling the enemy's attack is to divide and conquer, to make us feel alone. And we're not alone. And we need not only to pray for each other, but to communicate with each other and to encourage each other. Number seven, memorize a verse. If you can understand a verse, you can memorize it much easier. And so, again, this meditation and memorizing go together. I don't have to memorize my living room. You could ask me what kind of material, what's the purpose of each piece of furniture, what's its location, and I could go through it in three or four different ways. The color scheme, right? Because I'm familiar enough with it. And so if people are familiar with a verse, it's halfway to memorizing it. And the little children may need to memorize, but older people should meditate. And as they meditate, memorizing becomes so much easier. But I think it's a good thing for us to memorize the Word of God, to hide it in our hearts. It's the world's best all-time seller. And so when um, I talk to somebody, I can say to them, hey, here's a sentence I memorized today. Can I give it to you? And people would say, of course. I don't even have to tell them it's from the Bible. And I just quote the sentence to them. And many people are amazed at the wisdom that is communicated through one sentence of the Bible. And then I can share it with them that it's actually from the Word of God. Number eight, in your heart at least, sing a love song to the Lord. Some people find this very strange, but the Lord loves to hear us singing his praises. And it's the first evidence of a spirit-filled life. In Ephesians chapter 5, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This isn't just mere entertainment. This isn't like the person in the car beside you that's beating on the steering wheel and hopping up and down listening to some worldly song. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Israel went into battle singing the victory song. So there's, there's power in that. There's energizing in singing the Lord's praises. And as I say, it's making melody in your heart. So even when you're on the job, you may not be able to lift your head back and sing like you're in the shower, but you can sure sing in your heart to the Lord. And the Lord is, is blessed by it, and your heart is strengthened by it. It's a good thing to do. And so even to have a little hymn book in your car, or to have a, a hymn copied off in your pocket, this is my hymn for the day, learning all the verses, thinking about it, thinking about scriptures that reinforce those verses, and turn it into praise, to praise the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's part of our role as priests to be praising the Lord, offering the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. Number nine, take a few photos of creation on your phone and share them. We need to get on heaven's wavelength. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Right. So we often think of the other passage in Revelation where they say you're worthy because you were slain and you've redeemed us to God by your blood, but the first verse of that hymn is actually singing praise to him as the creator. So to be able to look at the beauty of creation and say, I know the person that invented that flower, that designed that bird, that threw those stars in space. And to remind God's people against a wave of evolution, everywhere we hear it, everywhere we look, people have imbibed the evolutionary lie. And one of the ways we fight against that 
by being sweet and happy is by just enjoying the beauty and order of God's creation and give him the credit for it. And so one suggestion is sharing the beauty of the creation around us like no other generation has been able to do and add a little scripture that reminds people that it was our Lord Jesus that made the world and everything beautiful in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And we can share that and encourage others. And number 10, write something. <laughs> Years ago, I was speaking on Bible symmetry down in Florida and a medical doctor came to me and said, so you enjoy Paul's spoken ministry more than his written ministry? And I said, well, actually, I never got to listen to Paul preach. He said, well, then write it down. <laughs> and uh, we've all heard the saying that the faintest ink is stronger than the best memory. And uh, when we write things down, it does several things. It helps to clarify it in our own thinking. We have to have it more accurate and exact. It allows us to share it with others. It helps us to remember things that otherwise we might forget. So it could be a journal entry, it could be a memo to yourself, it could be a love note to your spouse, it could be the beginnings of a little song of praise to the Lord. Who knows, it could develop into a book. I know the story of an executive who wrote a bestseller in the time it took him to ride up to his office on the elevator every day. He kept cards in his pocket. When he got on the elevator, instead of watching the numbers, he figured out that the numbers always go in the same order, so he didn't have to watch the numbers. He'd pull out a card and he'd write a thought. And he would only write on the time he wrote in the elevator. And he was saying something, that you can take those few minutes that are otherwise wasted and you can turn them into productivity. The power of the pen to communicate truth. And the more we write, the better we get. Read good writers and learn to write well. And if we do this, there's tremendous power in that. To send a little note to someone, not with just flowery nothings, but to actually say something of substance, to write a, a note to a college student, a shut-in, a missionary. There's tremendous power in that, in communicating truth. And it doesn't take long to write a card, doesn't take long to write a postcard or send off a, an email or text, but learn to put things down on paper and send them away with God's blessing. Well, just a few things, a few ways to take five minutes and to redeem them, to turn them into eternity by um, being proactive, being intentional, looking for opportunities, not thinking of it as a wasted time, but incorporating these little activities into the few minutes here and there, and in the end, finding out that they sometimes are little seeds that spring up into a whole harvest of good things.